With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Well, welcome in, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us right here on Tactics, whether you're watching on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on Periscope, on Twitch, on Twitter. However you're reaching us, we appreciate you making us a part of your day right here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. Of course, those three things are true no matter where you are, but they're especially true here on Tactics. That's what we believe. So thank you for being a part of the program. I know what a lot of you are thinking. What is Caleb doing when his show usually comes on at 6? Why is he on at almost 9.30 at night? Well, that is partially my fault. It's partially some scheduling conflicts that I had because I just got back from a meeting with my other job, and so I couldn't get to you until now. So I apologize for that. But this is how much I enjoy the show, and this is how much I enjoy conversing with you every single day. It's a part of my day just like it's a part of yours, and we really appreciate the people that are dedicated to this show that listen in, we we appreciate everybody that listens to News Radio 1440, not just me. Mark Levin, uh, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity. I don't know why I lost my own lineup there for a second. And of course, Kevin Elkins, who's also right here in the great city of Montgomery. So, I got to tell you though, before we get into any of the news, it is hot as the Dickens, and I am sick of it. I am so tired of this weather now. For those of you who know me personally, you know that I just don't do well with cold. Or sorry, I don't do well with heat. I do much better with cold. I like the winter better. There's not nearly as many bugs. You don't sweat. If you want to put on a jacket, you can put on a jacket and become perfectly comfortable. At a certain point, you can only take so much clothes off. And <laughs> goodness knows that me and everybody around me would not want me to move past that point. So... <laughs> I'm just tired of it. It is hotter than a Fox News weather girl out there. I mean, it is absolutely scorching. And our news partners at WSFA recognize this. Here is a message from Josh Johnson, who is, of course, the chief meteorologist over at WSFA. Uh, today's high of 101 not only broke the record for this date, it is also the hottest temperature ever recorded in October in Montgomery. And of course, he's got the little meme there with Buddy the Elf saying, great job, you did it, congratulations, hottest day in October history. <laughs> uh, man, there's a, a good deal of whimsy over there, and Josh Johnson's a great guy, I've known him for a long time, way before he was even at WSFA, and, and I do really appreciate what he and the WSFA news team do for all of us at News Radio 1440, bringing us not only our news updates, but also weather we handle traffic in-house, but they bring us the, the other two things, and we are extremely appreciative of that. So I just thought that'd be a little fun thing to start the show out. I do have one other thing that I have to talk about before we get into the news. I probably won't be having a show on Thursday, or if I do, it's going to be a very, very short show. I'm probably just not going to be able to do it at all. But I do have a good reason, and it's connected to the show itself. Because at 7 o'clock on this Thursday, October the 3rd, Faulkner's annual benefit dinner is coming up. And I'm going to be honest, I don't want to badmouth my company, my university. I don't want to in any way insinuate that, you know, there's they're not doing amazing work over here because I wouldn't be here if that were not the case. However, in years past, I've not been super thrilled with some of the speakers they've gotten for the benefit dinner. It's just kind of been a little bit hit or miss for me. Bill O'Reilly, that was really cool. I really wanted to see Bill O'Reilly. When they brought in Donald Trump Jr., eh, not so much. When they brought in, uh, oh, what's his name? I think Brokaw was the speaker at one point. No, nah, no, I don't even really like watching him on the news. I certainly am not going to pay money to watch him here. So the Faulkner's had some really amazing speakers here. And they've also had some I didn't care about. But this year, oh my gosh, they got about as good as anybody you could have asked for. Nikki Haley is going to be at the Faulkner Benefit Dinner, and I could not be more thrilled. 
because you may remember if you've been watching this show for any length of time, especially back when Nikki Haley was our UN ambassador, that uh, I mentioned several times, and I still swear up and down I said this before Ben Shapiro did. I'm pretty sure that I coined this, and, and Ben Shapiro just kind of copied off of me later, which, as we all know, he's been riding my coattails for years. But anyway, uh, Nikki Haley absolutely is my spirit animal. Like, everything that you would want in a UN ambassador, Nikki Haley was it. And before that happened, I was not a big Nikki Fa Haley fan. I mean, I didn't dislike her, but she didn't exactly wow me as the governor. Partly, probably just because I wasn't paying as much attention. I don't live in her home state, and so there was no reason for me to necessarily be that huge of a Nikki Haley fan. But man, on the floor of the UN, you could not have asked for anybody better. And out of all of Donald Trump's picks, probably the only one that I think he did a better job on with his inner circle than Nikki Haley was oddly enough somebody that he wound up souring his relationship with very quickly, and that was, of course, our own Jeff Sessions. But, man, I mean, out of all those picks, Nikki Haley had to be up there right on par with Jeff Sessions, maybe even higher, and I'm super, super excited that Faulkner got her. I cannot wait to hear her, and I'm going to be there as a member of the press, as a member of News Radio 1440 covering that. So do not fear, even though... I know that this is a little off, but even though that is going to take place, there's not going to be a Thursday show, we are going to have a Friday special where I recap the speech in the evening from what Nikki Haley was saying. Of course, we're not going to be able to play clips from it directly. you, you got to buy tickets for that. But I am going to just kind of go over some of the things that she said. So if you can't be there, and I highly recommend that you try to be there if you can. It's a little late to get tickets now. You might be able to still find them. You might be able to buy them off of somebody. But if you can't be there, the second best thing is getting my analysis on it. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. So that will be coming up on Friday of this week. And I've got some very, very local news, which is somewhat depressing. Yesterday, we did get the news that the GM of the East Dale Mall, Chick-fil-A, he confirmed that it is going to be closing down. And I know that a lot of you are distraught. A lot of you really like Chick-fil-A. And if you do want to stop by East Hill Mall and get yourself Chick-fil-A and, and also get some Cinnabon or go to one of the other stores, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. And I know that that's incredibly depressing. And then what made this story even more strange to me, what made it even more odd, is that I looked at the story, which wasn't very long, actually, again, coming from our news partners at WSFA, and I noticed something really odd. The confirmation of when the Chick-fil-A was clo closing, because as you know, today is October 1st, start a new month. The day that it will be closing is October 31st. Let's see. That's just weird. A Chick-fil-A a company that has been known for its Christian values and marketing, closing on the day of Halloween. Who could have orchestrated this? Could it be Satan? <laughs> All right, so any of you that are fans of Dana Carvey know what that was referencing. But anyway, it is weird that it's happening on a Halloween that that's going to be moving away. Uh, but yeah, I, I hate that. And as a kid, I have really fond memories of going to East Del Mall. I'm pulling for it. I wanted to succeed. It's, I mean, it's really close to where I live now. It, it's super convenient. And I would really love to see a bustling mall that, that has people around it all the time, families coming to it. But let's be honest, in the past few years, and if you have been around the River Region area, as I have been my entire life, you remember that the signs that are popping up with Eastdale are darn similar to what was happening at Montgomery Mall back in the day. Over time, you started seeing places close down, you started seeing stores close up, and at, the, at first it wasn't real bad, and then you started noticing there were you know, about a store closed on every aisle, on every part of the mall. And then you started noticing two or three were closed on every part of the mall. And eventually they got down to the point 
that there just wasn't anything left in that mall. And I, the last time I went to Eastdale, which by the way was for Chick Fil A, so I mean <laughs> that's an, that's a really bad sign for Eastdale Mall that Chick Fil A is going to be gone, especially since the last couple times I think I went over there it was specifically for Chick Fil A. I remember looking around and thinking, man, half the food court doesn't have anything in it. Sabaros is gone. Half the restaurants are gone. Aladdin's Castle is locked up. There's not a movie theater over there anymore. And granted, the movie theater has been gone for a long time. But I just remember going down some of the aisles and like Dillard's has turned into a weird warehouse outlet store. It's still a Dillard's, but it's like a Dillard storage facility more than anything else. And a whole bunch of other stores have greatly downsized or left completely. To be honest, there's just not that much over there anymore. And with the exception of Cinnabon, because to my knowledge, we don't have another Cinnabon in the city. Maybe I'm missing that and, and feel free to, to tweet me if I'm incorrect on that. But that seems to be really like the only draw that you would have to East Dell Mall specifically that's left. Maybe Hot Topic if you're like me and like superhero shirts, but... I mean, even I buy those online now just because it's cheaper. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a real downsize of the mall taking place. And I think a lot of it has to do with crime. A lot of it has to do is that not only the mall itself, but that side of town is now perceived as somewhere that there's a lot of crime going on. And I honestly don't know as much about the crime rates in the different parts of the city. I don't even think that stats for that are available, but I can tell you right now that the people that live there, they know that after a certain time of night, you pretty much need to stay away. And the mall itself has had to take precautions and, and make sure that certain people under a certain age are not allowed there without an adult accompanying them because of the issues that they've been having inside that mall. And so it's gotten really bad and, and, I hate to say it, but this is why we can't have nice things. This is why a lot of the nice places in Montgomery have had to either close down completely or, or move up and, and move to a different part of town because we're seeing this. And, and so uh, you hate to see it. You hate to see an institution that's been there for that long just close up like that. But I don't know what else you'd do. I mean, if you're looking over at East Chase... It's really nice, and I guess that people really like the outdoor mall experience more. I personally, just kind of because I, I like air conditioner, I guess, really like the indoor mall experience, but the stores at East Chase are a lot nicer. The service is not infinitely better, but it is better. And so I hate to see this because I think that this is the, the swan song. Like Maybe if they kept Chick-fil-A and had kept a, a few other stores that maybe the mall stays afloat, but it's already been up for sale for about a year now. I just don't see East Elm Mall staying open much longer. I'm thinking it probably winds up closing its doors, I don't know, maybe within the next year, if that. And I hate to see that, but I think that's probably what's going to happen. I, I just do not foresee a way for the market to, to save it unless something severe is done about the crime and even then even if you started right now by the time that that perception goes away i i don't know that it's already too late it may be but i do hate to see that happen so speaking of local news we do have another article from al.com it was an article done by anna claire vollers and it's about motherhood now I'll say this. I have a weird love-hate relationship with AL.com, and I've mentioned this on the show a number of times. I'll occasionally read some of their articles where they're going in the right direction, but they reach the wrong conclusion, or you can tell that it's not really objective journalism, that it's straight-up activism. And honestly, that's kind of going on in this piece, and I'll explain why here in a second. But j just looking at the headline really tells you all you need to know about where the author's head is. When this is happening, the headline is fired for having a baby. Alabama is OK with that. Now, if you were an objective journalist doing a story, which I am not, I used to be. I'm not now. I'm an opinion guy. But if you were an objective journalist doing a story on this, 
even if the you wouldn't have to change a word of the story to change this headline and it to be true. And by the way, I'm not saying you need to lean in the other direction. I'm saying to be objective, it should say something like uh, Alabama law does not include protection for mothers that other states have. This clickbaity thing that it's obviously leading you in a certain direction. I mean, that headline, it, it, it makes it obvious what the goal of the article is. And the, there is a goal in this article, which is not the way that news is supposed to work. You're not supposed to have a goal. Your goal is to inform, not to sway somebody one way or the other. But in this article, it's very clear that there is a desired political result coming out of this. And so right off the bat, whether you agree with everything in the article or agree with nothing in the article, regardless of what stance you fall on, any objective person could look at this and say, yeah, that they're not playing fair. They're, they're clearly trying to get somewhere with this article. And that's one of the real issues that I have with it. I mean, you, you can tell the author has an ax to grind, and that's really what gets under my skin about it. And this happens a couple times in the article. I am just so sick and tired of so many journalists in the state of Alabama acting as though Alabama is some weird, backwards, handmaid's tale, apocalyptic state that treats women basically like they're living under Sharia law. That's absurd, and it's disgusting, and the hyperbole needs to stop. There is an assumption there, not by people outside the state, by people that are actually living in the state. And this comes down to a difference of worldview, that somehow women are deeply oppressed in the South. And that, well, because other places have these laws in effect, and, and I mean, these, there are other states that have protections, and I'll explain why protection is kind of being overly generous based on the results of these laws in a second. But they'll say, well, they, they have these protections and therefore they're more progressive and they're better for women. Well, there's a difference in having a special privilege that other people don't have and having equality. And this is something where they're asking not for equality, but for a special protection. And this is really where the, the article kind of goes off. And by the way, I encourage you, I, I have it posted on my social media, go in, read the article for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Actually go through and read the article because here's the thing. I actually think it makes several good points. I don't think that everything in this article is bad. I don't think everything in it is wrong. In fact, if I had to give a percentage, I would say about 70, maybe even 80% of the article is good. But the author's bias is clearly on display when this article is being put forward. And what's amazing to me is, if you have faith in your message, you don't have to do that. Like, if you're a journalist and you're looking at a story and you think very strongly that people should react in this way or that way, you don't have to stack the deck. If you believe that people are going to see that regardless, if you believe that the details in the story are going to lead somebody in that direction, you don't have to make it subjective. You can leave the facts where they are and step back because you have confidence in your message and say, there it is, and any rational person will reach this conclusion. But the thing is, even if you don't think that's the case, it's still not an excuse to skew it one way or the other. That's not what a journalist is supposed to do. And that's really one of my biggest gripes with this story is even when I agree with it, I can tell that there is definitely a axe to grind and they are trying to get to a certain thing. A good example of this is one thing that they, a point that they make over and over again in this article is like, even the South, even other Southern states have laws like this now, which again comes from this assumption that somehow the Deep South, because we're religious and Christian, that we're behind the rest of the country when it comes to women's rights. We're not. A lot of these other states have special privileges and laws that don't make sense on the books, or laws where government should not have any role playing in the economy, and they're referring to that as protections and saying it's better for women. Well, it is better for women because in a lot of cases, these laws give women privileges that men do not have under the law. And so it's hilarious to me that they're crying for equality, and that's their battle cry. But in execution, what it actually is is saying we're going to advantage our tribe over your tribe. And that's not the way that you should come at this. So let's get into to some of the content here. 
because I really don't think this is all bad. The article starts telling the story of a woman named Haley Gentle. And Haley was, like a lot of moms, goes in, has her baby, has to request off work, let's work no ahead of time, hey, I'm going to be able to be back at this time, and so I have to take maternity leave. When she does this, she goes in, has her baby, and then the doctor tells her, well, we're going to have to hold you out of work for a couple more weeks because there were some complications we didn't foresee. Her life isn't in danger or anything, but they're like, we're going to have to do some physical therapy. You're going to have to rest a little longer than we thought. And the doctor made this recommendation. He handed her a note and she showed it to her employer and all this stuff. And the boss was a jerk about it. I mean, granted, and remember, we're only seeing one side of this story because in the article, the the person that wrote the article uh, she had to admit that she reached out and they didn't respond, which, as a journalist, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to reach out for comment. If they say no comment, there's nothing you can do about that. So I, I don't blame that part on her. But because of that, you do have to remember that you're only hearing one side of this story. And so, based on everything in that article, her boss was a real jerk about it. He was saying, no, no, no you, if you want to keep your job, you have to come back to work at the day that you originally told us that you were going to. And so that's really what started off this whole thing. And then there was an issue where she was saying, well, I, I would need to be able to, I'm going to be breastfeeding. And so is it going to be a problem if I just go ahead and, and breastfeed at work? So already this woman has defied her doctor's orders and ignored her physical therapy, even though her doctor recommended that she have it, to return to work at the correct time. And she says, look, would it be okay if I do um, some, some breast pumping so that my baby has enough milk uh, when she's away from me? And I can do this during lunch hours. It'll take about 20 minutes, and, and I may need a 20-minute break uh, at some point during the day to go ahead and do this. And the guy was just an absolute, I, words I can't even, don't need to say as a Christian man and, and really don't need to say on the airwaves about it and was making a big fuss about it. And what's really amazing about this is that she works in a closed office. It wasn't like she's a cashier or something where other people can just walk in or customers can walk in. She works in a closed office. The only other person in that office with her is a woman who had already said that she wouldn't mind if she did her breast pumping because she has a, a hand-free pump at her workplace. She would be covered up and everything. The woman said that she didn't mind if she did that and would be able to continue working while doing that. And the guy still said no. And another thing, he started claiming that, oh no, she didn't get put on maternity leave. She was no longer employed here and she was going to return to her job later. And of course, her response is, uh, that's not what we originally said. And if I was no longer working there, then why was my desk still set up? Why were the pictures of my family still sitting on my desk? It sounds like what this guy was trying to do is drop her and drop her insurance so he wouldn't have to pay for it. And was trying to weasel out on doing that because she wasn't going to be back to work at the time that she wanted to. So by everything that's in this article, this guy's an absolute sleaze. And the reason that, that I am just so hacked off about this is, frankly, I wish that the article had included the name of the company that this guy works for. Because there's no way that the company or her boss should get off scot-free because of this. And I know that there's going to be a lawsuit later, which is actually going to be a much bigger deal, but I would far rather the press handle it and just word get out and people say, huh, probably don't need to frequent that business anymore. That would actually be, in my opinion, the better way to handle it. And so based on this story, it looks like this woman, Haley, did everything right. That she was a model employee, she was trying to come back, actually did come back before her doctor recommended that she did because she wanted to work there. And was being as accommodating as possible, trying to, to make sure that her having a kid didn't interfere with her work, and that at every turn the boss was just a jerk about it. So 
the guy is an absolute scumbag. And, and I don't think any rational person looking at this set of facts, at least the information that we have provided from this article, would be able to look at that and say anything different. I think that that's absolutely fair. I'm saying it. But here's the other side to that. It goes the activist route, much like Haley herself. And, and I mean, if she wants to advocate for something politically, she's certainly well within her right to do that. That's the issue that I have with it, is they're saying, because this bad thing happened to this person, what we should do is we should make it illegal to have all these other things. In other words, it should be illegal to not let women off for, you know, when they're pregnant or whatever, um, not let women off for this certain amount of time when their doctor recommends it, uh, not let women breastfeed at work, which in her situation, I totally understand why that was a reasonable request. But there's hundreds and thousands of other jobs that you can do where breastfeeding in the middle of the day while not leaving your workstation would not be a reasonable request. And I'm not throwing any kind of blame towards her, but I'm saying when you're putting out laws and saying that someone can't do this, that's where the accommodation becomes a problem. Because you're going to make a one-size-fits-all blanket law that everybody has to abide by when it comes to having pregnant employees. And it's going to cause problems for other jobs that don't have Haley's specific set of circumstances. In her circumstance, yeah, that would be perfectly reasonable, but that doesn't mean it's going to be that way for every job. And here's the thing. Just let the free market sort itself out. Just let the free market sort itself out. And the reason I say that is laws like this tend to only incentivize employers for not hiring women or scare them into not hiring women. So they wouldn't actually say, well, I'm not going to hire a woman because of this. But if you know that there are laws hanging over your head and that you have a young woman just starting a family, you know that there's a good chance that at some point in her employment she's going to be pregnant and there's going to be all these rules and hoops that you have to jump through and it's going to be far more expensive to take on a female employee, that actually makes employers less likely to hire a woman. So these laws that wind up being set up to protect women wind up actually hurting them in the long run. That tends to be what's happened, not in every circumstance, but as a general rule, these laws that usually are put in place to protect people in the workplace like this wind up doing the exact opposite because of the cost of compliance and because it's going to be a much bigger hassle. It causes people to be afraid to hire women or incentivizes them for just hiring men because Men are never going to get pregnant. I don't care what people on the left say, a man cannot get pregnant. That is a proven scientific fact. If, if somebody's telling you otherwise, one of two things is happening. You're either talking to a crazy leftist that thinks that men and women are not a thing, or you're watching a movie with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's, it's one of those two scenarios. Uh, and if you actually got that second reference, you know, <laughs> bless you. Uh, but another thing that this is a problem with is it leads to abuse and extra costs that gets passed, passed along to the consumer. And this is another thing that, again, incentivizes employers, once these laws are passed, to not hire women. Because if these things are going to be the, the stringent way that they're kind of suggested that they would be in the article, then it is not beyond the realm of possibility. In fact, it's far more likely that there are going to be women that do abuse the fact that they have that time off that they would have to be paid for and that kind of thing. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. I She hasn't drawn up the law that, yet, and it hasn't been you know put to paper yet. Maybe it wouldn't be that way. But when this happens, usually it opens up the floodgates for abuse. And yeah, Haley, in this one particular story, seems to be a model mom and a model employee. But there's a lot of people out there that aren't. And if they can take advantage of the system, they are going to take advantage of the system. And that's why, again, I'm not dismissing any law that might come out of this, but I'm hesitant to just jump on this bandwagon that the activist journalist seems to uh, seems to want to jump on. And the reason that I say let the free market sort it out, it seems like what eventually happened is going to be what's in the best interest for everybody, and I'll explain in a second, but this idiot lost a good employee, one that was really dedicated to her work, one that really wanted to do a good job and to work for him and to give it her all because he was so dumb that he couldn't put up with an inconvenience 
And in some cases, in the breastfeeding case, I don't even see how that's an inconvenience, but wasn't willing to put up with the inconvenience of her being gone for a few weeks. Yeah, well, you know what the free market does to that person? They get punished by having employees that are not as good. And so this is what's so great about the free market. I'm not saying that there are never any need for regulation or there are never anything there are never any needs for some kind of oversight, but this doesn't seem to be an example of why there needs to be government intervention here. Because for one, can you imagine the PR nightmare that this would create if they actually had included the name of the company in the story? And I don't know why that they didn't. But I got to tell you, I don't like the law that is, I don't like the potential law that would be proposed per se, and I don't like the idea of the government getting involved. But I don't believe that I'd be buying whatever it is that I buy from these people. If that were the case, I think that once word got out, you would see so much negative PR, the company would straighten up and fly right or suffer the consequences and the loss of business. Either way, they get punished for bad behavior and should. That's the way a free market is supposed to work. Because good companies that serve their customers and their employees are the ones that tend to do better in the business environment. And the ones that don't, they get punished by the market. The invisible hand of the market solves so many problems that government winds up only making worse most of the time. And here's the thing. Whether they intended to or not, the article itself actually makes the case for why the free market should be the model that we move to on this. Let me read an excerpt from this same article. Shortly after she lost her job, Haley heard from her old boss. He offered her her job back with unpaid pump breaks. But at that point, Haley had sent out a flurry of resumes and gotten hired at another medical practice, Tennessee Valley Pain Consultants, part of the Huntsville Hospital System. During orientation, she said the leader, of, uh, the leader showed her the company's private lactation room, that amazes me that they have a lactation room, but anyway, and explained that she has the freedom to pump when she needs to without having to ask permission. Haley said that she's been shocked by the response she got after sharing her story publicly. She's received messages on social media and hundreds of comments. She said most of the women who shared similar experiences. Quote, he ruined my life for a short time, Haley said of her former employer. But if anything, he gave me a platform and now I can talk about this. So before she ever even filed a lawsuit, or without the assistance of the government or a new law, what happened is, to use her own words, he ruined my life for a short time. And then what happened? She got a better job that was more accommodating, might even make more money. It doesn't really talk about that detail. But the point is, she's in a better position now than she was beforehand. Yeah, it sucked for a little while, but you'll also notice that her old job, her old employer wanted her back and was willing to compromise because he wanted her back. So in other words, the free market did exactly what it was supposed to do. When an employee was being treated unfairly, she decided to take her labor somewhere else. And she did and found a place that appreciated her labor more. And even if she hadn't found a new job, she could have gone back to her old job and got what she wanted. But the better outcome came, which is it punished the guy that was being a jerk about it and rewarded the person with a better, far more accommodating job that now she can enjoy and is better for her and her family. This is what I've been trying to say. Just because the government can do something doesn't mean it ought to do something. Yeah, the government could pass some kind of law to where this specific scenario didn't happen, but it would probably cause even more unpleasant scenarios for the very people that the law purports to protect in other circumstances. And it all worked itself out anyway. The free market did exactly what the free market is supposed to do. And so even though I don't think the article intended to make this point, it actually makes a very strong case for following the free market model. Everything that the free market was supposed to do happened in this story before the law got involved. She got a better, more accommodating job. The guy that was a jerk about it lost a great employee and didn't realize it until she was gone. That's what capitalism is supposed to do.
It rewards the people that treat people right. It punishes the people that don't. Doesn't work in every scenario and every single time, but way more than any other system that we have. Because there is a distinct difference in wanting something to be done and thinking the government should force it. Because if you're looking at these two scenarios, the scenario that actually did happen because of the marketplace and the scenario that could happen where the government forces somebody into doing it, I'd 10 times rather have it be voluntary. Have people that are willing to accommodate good employees and get rewarded for that instead of having to force that onto everybody and to cause problems for the marketplace and for the employers and the employees that they're trying to protect. This is just overall a better scenario. What we have to do is get out of this mindset that the government is here to solve all the world's problems. They're not. Nine times out of ten, they wind up screwing it up even worse than it would have been if we had just left it alone in the first place. And this is a brilliant example of that. So, good day for moms. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back in just a minute. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post, head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Transdenominational Community Church and Coffee House in Nevado, California. And now for a reading from the SJW Bible. Today's reading will be from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 2 through 10. And a centurion slave was sick and about to die. When he had heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus was triggered upon hearing this and said, None of the good things he has done matter because he is a slave owner, and we must never admit that anyone that ever owns slaves is capable of doing anything good. Furthermore, instead of asking me for help, you should have passed universal health care by now so that he could receive treatment for free. Then Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my slave do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, this man is engaged in systematic oppression. He is clearly engaging in wage slavery by controlling the means of production to exploit the labor of those around him. Then Jesus gathered up a mob and protested on the centurion's lawn all night long with torches and signs reading, Down with the Patriarchy, terrifying him and his family. We never really found out what happened to the centurion slave. Wow. So inspiring. Thank you for listening to this reading of the SJW Bible. And remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. No, you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. And today's Daily Dose of Stupid comes to us from Senator Elizabeth Warren. That's right, the Democratic presidential hopeful has done something stupid yet again. So the latest thing that Warren has come out with is that she is backing AOC's new welfare plan. Oh, goody. I do think it's hilarious that somebody that is trying to paint themselves as the most logical person, the one that's the most uh, wonkish, the person that is you know, really good at math and that kind of thing, that she's teaming up with AOC. That seems like an odd person that you'd want to hitch your wagon to if you're trying to come off as a smart person. But nonetheless, that's what Elizabeth Warren tries to do. So AOC's newest plan is referred to as a just society. That's what they're calling it. And it contains some of the dumbest ideas that you're ever going to see. One of which is rent control. And not just rent control, national rent control. 
Now, rent control has been an unmitigated disaster in every single place that it's been tried. In fact, they did a survey of economists. I think it was the University of Chicago that, that did this. And they did a study of 21 different metropolitan areas. And in every single one, over 80% of the economists said that it had been an absolute disaster when tried in different places. So rent control is a mess. It always has been. You cannot artificially decide what something's value is. It can't be done. The marketplace has to do that. Because when you try to arbitrarily assign a set value to something, then inevitably it winds up underselling and hurting the person trying to sell or overselling and hurting the person trying to buy. The marketplace does a much better job and does it for free, by the way, what government has to struggle just to, to get somewhere near competent and still screw it up. So national rent control is, it's already something that's been tried over and over and over again. Everybody that has any sense agrees that it's ridiculous and it doesn't actually help. In fact, it usually makes rent worse because it can do things like create a false scarcity or it can artificially keep the prices way too low, which winds up with, with people buying more than they need. So there, there's all kinds of different reasons why rent control is a really, really bad idea. It makes housing less affordable and makes it less available as well. And what happens is then people just tend to build property in places that either don't have rent control or people move out to places that don't have rent control or what they wind up doing is you'll have one person buying more than they need and then have availability that is less for everybody else. So there's a number of reasons why this is a bad idea. And here's the craziest thing about national rent control. How on earth would you have a national rent control when you have in this country places like New York City and the areas right outside Washington, D.C. and L.A., where the cost of living is through the roof, the highest in the world, and you compare that to places like rural Alabama, where the cost of living is practically nothing. I mean, a one-bedroom studio apartment with a bathroom that you share with four other people would be enough to buy you probably a few acres in the state of Alabama with your own house on it. And so the cost of living comparison, there's absolutely no comparison there. How are you going to have a national law that regulates all of that? It can't be done. This idea that people in Washington, D.C. are so much smarter than the rest of us that they can, from D.C., determine what the price of a house should be in Alabama, in Montgomery, in Huntsville, or in Slapout, or Marbury, or Wetumpka, that they know better than the people that live there what the price ought to be. Central planning doesn't work, and that's a perfect example of why it's a bad idea. Another thing it does is it reevaluates poverty considerations. There's a couple of reasons why this one's disturbing. One is that it considers internet access a necessity, which it is certainly not. Goodness knows I want as many people to have internet access as possible, considering I'm on the internet right now, so it's really important to me monetarily that people have internet access, but I still wouldn't consider it a necessity. It's not like heat or food. I mean, these are not comparable things to being able to binge watch Netflix. I mean, yes, it's nice, but it's not a requirement. But that's actually the, the least disturbing part of this in the poverty consideration. It also has and assigns people with a worker-friendly score, which includes things like union membership. In other words, they want to incentivize being a member of a union because, of course, they're Democrats. And who are the biggest donors to Democrats? Hmm. Oh, yeah, workers' unions. So they're trying to give incentives to people to join a union, which then turns around and gives campaign donations to Democrats. Funny how that worked out. It's almost like they were trying to do that. And another reason why this is really stupid and disturbing is it's oddly similar to Project Dragonfly in China that they're working on right now trying to give people a social score. In other words, trying to grade how well you're doing as a citizen 
when it comes to the way that you're living your life. If you're doing things that the government deems as good and worthy, then they reward you with certain things. And if you're not, they punish you or they take things away from you. Now, granted, this doesn't go quite that far, but even the project in China had to start somewhere. And so giving people a social score and social points, it's again another very open attempt to try to control your life from afar, to tell you, no, no, we know better than you peons out in flyover country. We'll tell you the way you need to live. We'll tell you what you need to eat. We'll tell you what you need to watch. We'll tell you what unions you need to be a part of. Because you're too dumb to figure that out on your own. So we'll take care of that. It's absolutely asinine. And this part, it doesn't surprise me that Warren is in favor of, because even though she's not as progressive as AOC on some things, the truth is Elizabeth Warren has always been and will always continue to be, even when she was considered more of a moderate senator. senator she always was a big believer in centralized government control. She believes she's smarter than everybody else, and because of that, she should be running your life, not you. That's silly to think that you could even do that without her. Another thing it does is it makes it illegal to deny welfare based on any legal status. Now, that's interesting. So, if you're an illegal alien, specifically, this is one of the things that this bill points out, if you're an illegal alien, then you can't be denied welfare. Doesn't matter that you're not a citizen. Doesn't matter that the people paying taxes may have been in America and, and been citizens since the days of the Revolutionary War, and you showed up 25 minutes ago with no skills and nothing to contribute to society. Doesn't matter. You get welfare. We're going to take their tax dollars and give it to you. Oh, and to add insult to injury, and this should surprise no one, that would also include ex convicts. So, in other words, once you've, paid, once you've paid your debt to society, if you're just not making enough money, then we'll take it from the hard-working, law-abiding citizens that are doing their part and are contributing to society. We're going to take their money and give it to you, the ex-con. Now, once somebody's paid their debt to society, yeah, by all means, once they've done their sentence, I don't want to hold anything against them. And by all means, go out, live your life. As long as you're obeying the law after that point, I don't have a problem with you. But the idea that we would be giving welfare to those people, that we would be supplementing their lifestyle with welfare by taking money from law-abiding citizens, how does that make any sense? That's what I'm having a hard time figuring out here. And... When you're talking about a just society, because remember, that is the title of this thing, a just society, you're really trying to tell me that stealing money from the hardworking people, and by the way, AOC's policies would necessarily increase that tax burden, you're telling me taking more of their money is just, and giving that money to the people that broke the law, that's what's going to make us a just society. You've got to be kidding me. All right, and then finally... This bill is, this part's kind of symbolic, but I think it may be the most important part of the bill because it would classify healthcare, housing, and healthy food as a human right. Now, there's a reason that this is absurd. First of all, you need a constitutional amendment for that. You can't just start making up human rights. I mean, I know that the Supreme Court seems to do it all the freaking time, but no, you can't just make up a right out of whole cloth out of thin air. If it's actually a human right, then you need to be able to go through the arduous process of getting a constitutional amendment codified into law in our Constitution. Now, I think that that's a ridiculous idea, but if you think that it's a human right, that needs to be the way that you do it. These half measures where you're just going to pass a law and think that that's going to be good enough? No, something like that needs to actually be a constitutional amendment. There's no reason to try to pass this into law otherwise. We don't have any other human rights that come from other arbitrary laws. They come from the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States. And so AOC is just trying to cut corners here. But more importantly, and getting to the philosophical level, food and... Uh, healthy food specifically, so not even just like regular food, it has to be healthy food, whatever the heck that means. 
but healthy food and housing and health care cannot be human rights. Why? Why is it important to know why those things cannot be human rights? Because they require somebody else. They require consent. Because what you own, your property, is that which you have the right to deny to others. If I have a house, for example, and I don't, but if I have a house and I cannot keep other people from coming into my house and using anything inside the house that they want, it's not my house. I mean, even if my name is on the deed, if it's perfectly legal for anybody to come in and just crash on my couch without my permission, whether I want them there or not, it's not my house. My car, if at any time there was a law that said, no, whenever you're driving, if somebody jumps in the car and, and says, no, no, I want you to take me to this place, then it's not my car. I don't own that car if that is the case. If somebody with no legal penalties can just take my car for a ride, then it's not my car. And the same is true of labor. If I am a doctor and I have spent years in medical school and years more in practicing medicine in the different area that I'm in, whatever special area that is, and someone says, treat me, and I can't say no. Now, whether or not it's right to say no or not is a whole different scenario, but just dealing with the hypothetical in front of us here, if I'm not allowed to say no, then I am your slave. If I'm not allowed to say no, then I can't deny my experience, my wisdom, my knowledge. I'm not allowed to deny those things to you, and thus I do not own them. Same thing for farming. And by the way, I have been involved directly in agriculture before. I have grown animals and plants that people consume. I have done that and sold it to people, gotten money from it. So I have been engaged in agriculture. I know a little bit more about this side of it. If I have my years of experience in growing corn or tomatoes or beef, if I have all of that, but you're hungry, so you say, no, I have a right to food, therefore I have a right to the food growing there in your yard, well, then it's not my food. If I can't keep you from eating it, then it's not mine. It's the community's or yours or however you want to look at that. So that's why food and resources, commodities in other words, they cannot be rights because they require somebody else to act on your behalf to obtain them. Now, I have no problem with somebody growing their own food or treating themselves medically, or building their own house. That's fine. If, if it's their material, they didn't steal it or, or get it through ill-gotten gains, and, and they want to build it themselves or, or fix themselves up or, or eat their own food, by all means, more power to you, brother. Go ahead. But you can't require somebody else to gather it for you and then say, no, no, I'm entitled to it because it's my right. There is no such thing as a right that requires the consent or the labor of somebody else. There's just not. It's a natural, inborn, God-given God thing that you have from the time of your birth. You don't have a house from the time that you're born. Your parents might, but you don't. You don't have food from the time of your birth. Other people can provide you with that, but you don't. You don't have a right to property that somebody else gathered. There are other people that may have the responsibility of providing for things in the case of your parents. Obviously, that's an example. But there's a difference in that and you having a right to something. Let's look at sex. A lot of people treat sex as though it's a right. That's why they'll say, hey, you can't, um, you, you can't deny me birth control because they treat, they're treating sex as though it is a right, that I have a right to do that. It's something that I have to be able to do. That's absurd, and the reason that it would be is because what does it require? More than one person. Because if sex is a right, then there's no such thing as rape. Because it was my right to have sex with the people that I wanted to. Well, food and housing and medical care are the same thing. You don't have a right to what is somebody else's. You don't have a right to them. You don't have a right to their experience or their knowledge or their labor. You don't. Those are commodities, and when government treats that as commodities and, re and it respects the property, whether it's intellectual and intangible properties like wisdom and understanding or the physical property like food and housing that we just talked about, 
when it respects those rights, we get a better society. It's when government stops respecting those rights or thinks that it can centrally plan those things and distribute them evenly that we have millions of people starving like we did under the Soviet Union or under communist China. It's when they start thinking of those things as the property of the collective and you don't really own that, that's where we run into problems. When we respect people's property and expect them to gather and do for themselves and provide for themselves, they start producing more. That's the way to build a truly just society. And what this all boils down to, and I know that was a long explanation, why is, why is Senator Warren doing this? Why is she the only, the only Democrat senator so far that has endorsed this plan? Because Senator Warren is the out-of-touch old grandma that is trying desperately, desperately to get the kids to think she's cool. That's what's going on here. She really, really wants the kids to think she's the cool grandma that can get on board with the new ideas because she knows she desperately needs those votes. She's trying so hard to win over the Bernie Sanders crowd because she knows that if she can do that and if she can unite the Bernie bros to her cause, then she might have a chance at overtaking Biden. That's all this is about. This is just political posturing. I don't know whether or not Elizabeth Warren agrees with a lot of it. I think, as I laid out, the parts that are about central planning, I think she absolutely does believe in those. But I don't know how much Elizabeth Warren is on board with the rest of the stuff. But ultimately, that's what she's trying to do. It's pathetic. She tries so hard, just like she did in that video where she's like, oh yeah, um, Fortnite and stuff. I'm going to grab like a beer. It was so embarrassingly ungenuine. She's trying so hard to be somebody that she's not. And this is just one more example of that. She's trying so hard to be relevant and get young people to think that she's cool and that she can get on board with these new ideas. It's shameless pandering. It's frankly very well disguised shameless pandering, but it is shameless pandering. Nonetheless, she's really wanting AOC to kiss the ring so that she can sort of get those younger Democrat socialists on her side. But I think that the reason that Warren is doing this is AOC is ridiculously unpopular, even amongst Democrats. They took that poll among Democrat voters, and she couldn't even score over 30%. She's not even liked by her fellow Democrats, especially the ones in swing states, especially the ones in Iowa and New Hampshire that she's going to be coming up against, Warren is, in the upcoming primaries. So she's trying so hard to be liked by AOC and her ilk that she doesn't realize that winning over their vote is really not going to help her all that much. There might be some Bernie bros that migrate over there, but the Bernie bros don't really like her either. And I don't think that this is going to be a move that helps her much when it comes to this election. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that I am. And you see, what's going on here is that despite the fact that AOC is wildly unpopular amongst Democrats, she's currying that side of the vote because Elizabeth Warren is a political animal. And like a lot of political animals, Republicans and Democrats, they really do think that the way that the Washington Post opinion column reads, or that Rachel Maddow talks, that's what Americans are really thinking. It's not. So, yeah, you might win some brownie points with those people, but the idea that you're going to get people in middle America that just believe in a big welfare state but don't want socialism, that you're going to be able to win over those people by doing stupid stuff like this, it's a bad political strategy. And I think that it's eventually going to wind up blowing up in Pocahontas' face. Let's go to the Chaplain's Report. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumul. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Joshua. And Joshua is one of the most fascinating and I think probably 
one of the more underrated Bible characters, in my opinion, to really set the stage for what's going on here. This is in the very first chapter of Joshua, and Moses has just died. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite. You're an Israelite. You've been a slave pretty much your entire life in Egypt. And then you see this guy named Moses. Now, maybe you were a little kid, or maybe you were like a young adult when he showed up on the scene. Now it's 40 years later, and, and you're a full-grown man. You met this guy named Moses who has been leading your people out of Egypt, and you saw the ten plagues take place. You saw him sweeten the waters. You've seen him get water from a rock. You've seen the sea split and walked on dry land. You've seen all these amazing things. And your whole life, except for the, the brief part at the beginning where you were a slave, your whole life, the only thing that you've known is following Moses. Now, ideally, what was in your heart is that you were following God and seeing Moses as his representative, and that's why you were following Moses. But the point is, you don't know any other leader. I mean, you think about this. Put, put yourself in these shoes. Let's say that we had a president that had been president for 40 years. And he was a president when you were a little kid, as far back as you can remember. All you've known as the leader of your people is this guy. And here you are, a full-grown man with kids of your own now. And that guy has died. Can you blame the Israelites for being a little anxious and a little lost? I, I don't think you can. I think it's perfectly understandable that they got some anxiety and they're not real sure what's going to happen here. We, we've been so used to Moses for so long. And this Joshua guy, yeah, he, he seems like a great guy, but, I mean, come on, he's not Moses. And then Joshua reveals this speech from the Lord to Israel, and this is recorded in the very first chapter of his book. This is from Joshua 1, 8 through 9. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may care be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You see, I've heard this verse so many times throughout my life. I go to people's houses, and it's up on signs. They've got it painted on the walls. It's a very popular verse, and I've seen this verse my whole life so many times that, that I, I just know it, and I, I don't really even think about it when I read it. When you put it into that context, it has a lot more depth than just the raw words. And the words are beautiful, don't get me wrong. There's a reason this verse is popular. But ultimately, it goes so much deeper than that. When you put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite. How does he start out there? By talking about the book. The law is not to depart from your mouth. You see, this is the theme that's behind this whole exchange between Joshua and the children of Israel. It's not me. And it's not Moses. Yeah, Moses was the representative. And yeah, I'm the guy now. I'm just the mouthpiece. It ain't coming from me. Everything that we've been through, the miracles, the speeches, the way of life that we've made for ourselves, it all came from God. And so, don't be afraid. Don't be freaked out about this. You were following God before when Moses was in charge. You're following God now. God's the one that matters, not me. And Moses was a great leader, and, and sure, I'll try to do the best that I can to live up to that. But ultimately, you have to remember that it's God that's the one that's with us, and it was God that was with Moses, and he's the reason that all those things happened. So now, of course... What really matters is not whether I'm in charge or Moses is in charge, but that God is in charge. And that's really what he's trying to use to sway the doubts, to try to instill in them a sense of, okay, we are going to be okay. 
and everything is going to be all right because God's not going to leave us. He didn't leave us before. He didn't leave us to rot in Israel or in Egypt. He didn't leave us when the Egyptian army had us cornered, and he's not going to leave us now. Even if, God, if, even if Moses is gone, God didn't go with him. And so that's part of what he's trying to do to comfort it. And I, I love this part. The way that they're to know that is to look at the law, because that's their commonality, isn't it? That if we want to follow God, if we want God to look down favorably on us, all we have to do is follow the law. It's not about people. It's not about Moses, and it's not about Joshua. It's about God and his commands and his relationship with us. That's what counts. And so Joshua's first bit of advice is, don't let the law depart from your mouth. You do what the law says. You act accordingly, and you'll be fine. And by the way, be courageous and brave and, and be strong, because God is going to be with you when you're trying to accomplish this purpose. So really, this is broken up into three different parts. This command is broken up into three different parts. First is to learn. We have to study God's law. We have to, as the scripture says here, meditate upon it daily. And of course, what that means is we're supposed to think about it. We're supposed to look deeply into it and try to figure out what it is that God wants from us, the attitude, the lifestyle that he wants us to live. And once we've done that, then we've accomplished the first part and can move on to the second part that Joshua talks about, which is act. You'll notice that after we have been able to speak the law and we have the law in our heart, we're supposed to do what it says. Knowing the law is great, but if you don't actually do what the law says, it doesn't do you any good. If you see a speed limit sign that is 75 miles an hour, and you go 90, are you really better off than the guy that went 90 and didn't realize that it was 75 miles per hour? Well, in practice, no. I mean, I guess it's good that you know that, but it didn't really do you any good and it didn't stop you from endangering other people by ignoring the law. And so it's not just knowing the law, it's also applying that to your life and trying to conform your own life to the laws of God. And then finally... The last part of that is persevere. You learn the law, you do what the law says, and then Joshua gives them some encouragement on being able to accomplish this task. He's saying, yeah, keep going. Be strong, be courageous, press on, move forward. Why? Because God is with us. I get that it seems daunting. I get that what we're about to do, invading the land of Cana, taking away their land, that's going to be real hard. But we'll be fine because God is with us. And that is a sentiment that is eternal. Because isn't that the same message that Jesus gives to his followers? Understand my teachings, understand the law, meditate upon it, then go forth and do it. Be good to your brothers and sisters, be good to your fellow man, do my will, spread the gospel, and persevere. Don't just do it for a little while and then the second you meet resistance, throw your hands up and be like, ah, I tried. Oh, it's it's really scary, and I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. No, that's that's not okay. Be strong and courageous. God wouldn't give you this task if you weren't up to it. And that's true of us today, too. That's true of us today, too. When God tells us to do something, when he gives us a command, he does that knowing that we can accept it, knowing that we can actually follow through on it. When he tells us to obey Christ and to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, he's not just saying it as some pie-in-the-sky idea. We can actually do that. And he does not leave us ill-equipped for the job. Yeah, charging into battle is a scary thing to do. It takes courage. It takes strength. And that's why God tells us to have those things. But we should realize that there is no reason for us to be afraid that we can be strong and we can be courageous because we know that just like in Israel, the Lord is with us today too. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. 
Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalrada Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.